I think the first thing I'm supposed to do is not hit the all off button. Lecture two. Okay. Um, uh, so I wanted to, well, first of all, apologize for my formal dress. I'm only in a suit because I was in court today. Otherwise, I'd be dressed normally. Um, I want to start by thanking um, uh, Leslie and Omar, the, the co-organizers of uh, the series, for, for inviting me and including me in uh, such a great group of, of guest lecturers. I want to thank all of you in the audience, both the students and the members of the public, uh, friends, family, uh, friends who are like family for being here today. Um, it's really exciting, actually, to be at Cooper Union, given the, the history of the institution, and particularly in this space. Uh, my sister, my older sister, who's an architect, and I actually visited this space before it was inhabited, and so it's great to see it now that it's lived in and, and to see it being put to, uh, to various uses, including this one. Um, let me try to start by uh, framing what I hope to get into with all of you today uh, by way of our conversation. I think it's important to get some of the fundamentals, some of the basic questions that uh, you know, most people have about uh, the prison at Guantanamo Bay, but that perhaps they were too afraid to ask or never had an opportunity to ask um, in order to, to give everyone sort of a common and solid and proper foundation for a deeper critical examination of what the place represents, what it means, in the most sort of concrete and human ways for the prisoners who are there and their families. But in order to get to that sort of point of critical examination, I think it's important to lay uh, sort of a basic foundation and ask and try to answer um, some, some fundamental questions that I'm sure have crossed your minds if, if you've ever sort of thought about uh, the existence of this prison and its significance. So I'm gonna try to do that, and I'm looking forward to uh, the, the question and answer with a uh, session with all of you. Uh, and obviously the conversation with, uh, with the students, the non-public part of uh, our time together today. Um, so let me start with, um, with maybe the, um, the first question that um, I often get, um, and, and not just myself, but my colleagues uh, and the students, the law students who I've worked with over the years since 2005, uh, representing prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and, and that question is, you know, how do you find your clients or how do your clients find you? The, the photo that you see up here on screen is a photo of um, uh, a team from Fordham Law School where I was teaching at the time. It includes my colleague, Professor Martha Rayner there, who still runs the criminal defense clinic there, and a group of students uh, who are with us. And, and basically the way we ended up in this photograph that was taken at a hotel in Bahrain in the, in the Persian Gulf was, was that we put out ads, Arabic language ads, in various pan-Arab newspapers that were published in the Gulf region. And, and the ads said, if you know or, or think that your loved one um, might be in U.S. custody somewhere, if your loved one has disappeared and you think he might be at a U.S. prison, at Bagram, at Guantanamo, or maybe one of the secret CIA prisons that the existence of which was suspected at that point, uh, please come to this hotel in Bahrain um, during these following dates. And so we published that ad and then we traveled to Bahrain and many families, and the reason we chose Bahrain was because it was a, an accessible location for people from Saudi Arabia, people from Yemen. And so many families traveled from various Gulf countries, uh, the UAE, uh, Oman, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and met with us and other lawyers there who were offering to represent their imprisoned loved ones on a volunteer basis. And so the men that you see here in, uh, in sort of in traditional um, Arab clothing uh, were relatives of two different prisoners who we later determined were imprisoned at Guantanamo. We ended up representing one of them. At the time, they didn't know where their loved one was. All they knew was that their loved one disappeared. Uh, they thought he might be in U.S. custody somewhere, but they hadn't heard from him for, uh, for upwards of, of uh, two years at that point. Um, the, the next question we... That, that my students and I often get is, you know, where is the prison? And so obviously the, the, uh, the U.S. Naval Base, uh, U.S. Naval Station at Guantanamo Bay is located in Cuba. It's been under the control of the United States since the early 20th century um, as a result of the Spanish-American War, where to make a long story short, the Americans offered uh, the nascent Cuban government uh, a proposal that they couldn't refuse. They said to them, we can either retain control of the entire island 
or you can cede to us this strategically located 40 square miles at Guantanamo, at the Bay, um, for uh, an indefinite period of time. And it's the kind of lease, when you look at it, uh, it's the kind of lease that all of us in New York City wish we had. Um, it's the sort of lease where the, the landlord, so in this case Cuba, can't kick out the tenant under any circumstances, the tenant being the United States. The tenant can remain there for as long as they wish. Uh, the rent never changes. And, and only if the tenant abandons uh, that piece of land does it revert to Cuba. Um, and and the, the rent, I think, uh, sort of is the equivalent of 5,000 US dollars present day value. Um, and, uh, and the US government has been, has been sending a treasury check to the Cuban government every single year in that amount. And since the Cuban revolution, every single year almost, uh, the Castro brothers have been leaving that check uh, in a drawer uh, in their desk in their office in Havana. They've not been cashing the checks because the Cuban government's position obviously is that uh, you know, this is Cuban land and it should be returned to Cuba. Uh, but that's the history of the base. Uh, the, the, the prison was opened in 2002, January 11, 2002. But it's not the first time that prisoners were held at Guantanamo Bay. Um, in the 90s, there was a huge number of Haitian refugees, actually, that were held at Guantanamo Bay um, for, you know, some would say equally racist reasons having to do with the U.S. government's suspicion that some of them were HIV positive, uh, not wanting them to come to the United States, even though many of them had well-founded asylum claims. And so uh, those folks ended up stranded at Guantanamo basically as prisoners under different conditions, but essentially as prisoners until there was some litigation that uh, allowed them in 1993 to enter the United States. Um, so the, the next question we often get is, you know, how do you get to Guantanamo? And, and the answer is in a variety of ways. The photo you see here is a, is a military plane, a C-130. So over the years that I've been traveling to Guantanamo since 2006, um, you know, I've either gone there with my students in, uh, in one of these planes, a C-130, or sort of a more modern version of the same kind of military transport plane, a C-17, um, or sometimes in, um, in, a, in a small puddle hopper, like a 12-seater that flies out of Fort Lauderdale, or more recently in, in, uh, in sort of, you know, aircraft that look like modern, like sort of civilian aircraft that fly out of different uh, U.S. bases. Um, Here's a photo that, that I took uh, approaching um, on of one side of the base, what they call the windward side of the base, the, the eastern side of the bay. This is where the prison camps are, actually. Uh, it's, they're on that side of the bay, and sort of on the other side is where the, uh, where the airport is. Um, a question that, again, my students and I are often asked is, you know, where do you stay when you get there? Um, and over time, we've stayed at different places. So, it used to be originally that we would stay in these tents. Uh, these are Air Force military tents. They're rumored within the military to be the best. They're air conditioned. But they're actually kept so cold uh, as to be uncomfortable because you know, the idea is if it's cold enough, critters and rodents from outside won't, won't enter. Um, so that's, that's one possible kind of accommodation. Uh, the other is, uh, is this. It's called a Cusco, named after the company that makes them. They're basically shipping uh, containers, like commercial shipping containers that are converted to, uh, to rooms, to housing quarters. Um, so that's where I stay most of the time when I go there these days. Um, this is the inside of one of these Cuscos. It's, it's, it's Spartan, but it's comfortable. The, um, the other kind of accommodation that we have are these uh, converted marine barracks that over, over time have been upgraded to basically motel grade at this point in terms of comfort and amenities. Initially, when we started staying there, they were $15 a night and, and you'd have crabs and sometimes scorpions in your room uh, because the doors uh, were sort of off by, a couple, by an inch or two from the floor. Uh, but at this point, like they're air conditioned, they're really comfortable and they charge us $50 a night. Uh, so the prices have gone up. So those are usually the places we stay. Another question that we get, which I find a bit odd, is where do you eat? Um, but, uh, but I guess it's a normal question to ask. And, and so oftentimes you might, you might eat at Guantanamo at the mess hall and uh, everything you've heard about military food um, is true. Um, it is uh, to food what military music is to music. Um, but you can, you know, one thing that often surprises people is that when you visit um, 
the uh, U.S. naval base at Guantanamo, it's, it's a lot like many other um, U.S. military bases here in the United States or all over the world, right? It's, it's got all the amenities of sort of a small American, like average small American town, including a McDonald's, a Subway's, uh, I think at this point there's also a KFC, there's like a Starbucks outlet. So that surprises a lot of people that these sorts of amenities have made their way to Cuban soil. Um, a, a thornier question that's often asked is, you know, what is it like uh, traveling and working in a place like Guantanamo? Uh, for you, for the people you represent, for your students. And, uh, and you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a stunning place. Um, it's, it's located, obviously, in the Caribbean. Uh, it's in the tropical location. It's probably one of the sort of last pristine, relatively untouched corners of the Caribbean in the sense that there aren't the sorts of sprawling um, touristic developments that you would find elsewhere in similar locations in that region. Um, you know, there's, there's iguanas everywhere. Uh, there's, uh, there even, I don't know if you can read what that says, but it says do not feed the iguanas. And there's actually a running joke at Guantanamo that, that began with the prisoners and, and made its way to uh, the guards. And so the prisoners used to joke that um, at Guantanamo, if you, if you, I mean, because they, they found out from the guards that if you run over an iguana or if you harm an iguana in any way because they're a protected species, the guards can get fined up to $10,000 and there's even the possibility of jail time. Uh, for harming an iguana in any way. And so, uh, you know, military personnel like Guantanamo and their families are, are extremely careful around these reptiles for that reason. And so when the, when the prisoners um, heard about this from some of the guards, they started joking that, you know, the iguanas have more rights at Guantanamo than they did. And so that joke made its way back to the guards and to the military personnel and got out that way. Um, but, but the reason I... The reason I've always found that question to be thorny is that um, it, you know, Guantanamo is a, is a, it's the juxtaposition of what the place has come to represent uh, with its setting. Uh, it's, it's, it's that contradiction that I find so troubling. It's a, it's a hopeless prison. It's a place of misery, brutality, and sadness that's located in this pristine tropical setting. Um, so so that, that paradox mirrors also the paradox of my presence and my students' presence and the presence of, you know, our fellow lawyers at that place. Because it is, you know, in the end, we're there as lawyers in a place that was meant to be lawless. Uh, you have to remember that in 2002, when the Bush administration made the decision to bring prisoners from all over the world to Guantanamo, that decision was driven in large part uh, by the desire to then be able to argue in, fe in U.S. federal courts that these men have no constitutional rights. That, that the Constitution does not apply to them at Guantanamo because they are foreigners, because Guantanamo is not in the United States. So by design, it was supposed to be a law-free zone. It was supposed to be a lawless place where the U.S. government could get away with not only indefinitely imprisoning men for years without trial or fair process, but abusing them and torturing them. And I don't use those words lightly. Those things have been documented, substantiated, and even admitted in the case of one of our clients, uh, our clinic's clients, Mohammed Al Qahtani, who's, who's, who's actually the one individual in the entire U.S. global war on terror that the U.S. government has officially acknowledged torturing. There was a high-ranking Department of Defense official in 2009 who went on the record with the Washington Post and said that she would not allow him to be tried before a military court because he had been tortured at Guantanamo. Obviously, there are hundreds of people who have been tortured, if not thousands, by the United States in various prisons, known and unknown military prisons, CIA prisons, but he's the only one that the U.S. government has officially recognized having tortured. Um, so, so this is the, the now emblematic photo that has come to represent Guantanamo. It's a photo that was taken by an Associated Press uh, photojournalist on uh, January 11, 2002, the day that uh, the first plane load of prisoners arrived at Guantanamo from Afghanistan. Uh, so these are literally the first uh, prisoners who, who arrived there. They allowed the press to photograph them in, in violation of the Geneva Conventions. Um, you'll see how they're bound and hooded and shackled and earmuffed. So that's sensory deprivation. It's a form of torture. Uh, we, we had two clients who were on that plane, one of whom is still today at Guantanamo over 15 years later. Um, so 
getting deeper into the details, another question that is often raised is, well, on what legal authority has this been done? Um, what you see in front of you is, um, is the authorization for use of military force that was passed by the 107th Congress on September 18th, 2001. That date is significant. It's exactly one week after the attacks of September 11th. Um, and, and there's a reason why you, know, you might caution against legislating in a time of crisis, because what typically happens is expansive powers are handed over to the executive branch. And that's exactly what happened in this, the Authorization for Use of Military Force, known as the AUMF, and specifically in these words here, which have been described as uh, the 60 words that changed the world. So this single 60-word sentence in the Authorization for Use of Military Force, and specifically these words here, authorizing the use by the U.S. government of all necessary and appropriate force against anyone who they think had anything to do with the attacks that occurred on September 11th. These words have been used since then to justify everything from the invasion of Afghanistan to the invasion of Iraq to the use of drones to execute people without charge or trial, including U.S. citizens in places that we are not at war with, like Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Um, these words have been used to justify, obviously, the imprisonment of people without charge or fair process at Guantanamo, at Bagram, and even at secret CIA black sites. So these 60 words have literally been used to authorize a lot of what you all think of, a lot of what many of you have grown up with as, as uh, you know, after 9-11 as part of the, the US-led global war on terror. Um, I wanted to maybe be a bit more concrete about what, uh, what this prison um, actually translates to for, uh, for our, our clients, the men that we represent, and not just them. This is a facility known as Camp 5 Echo. We actually um, did not know that this facility existed until one of our clients, Shakir Amr, who you're gonna see up here um, in, a, in a meeting uh, with, with me, told me, or told me and my students that he um, was uh, actually imprisoned. He was being held at this facility in solitary confinement. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in many ways, um, what happens at Guantanamo can, can be described as, 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 as Kafkaesque. I think the, le the rest of the global war on terror outside of Guantanamo might be more Orwellian. But, you know, at Guantanamo, the process judicially, judicially and also what happens in these prison camps uh, is often befuddling to the point where, you know, this man was in solitary confinement, which meant that, you know, there's, there's an accepted definition of solitary confinement. He was in his cell for over 22 hours a day. He was allowed one or two hours of recreation, usually during the night, so he never saw sunlight by himself. He had no social contact with anyone other than the guards. Um, and, and yet, uh, the, uh, the prison administration at, at Guantanamo refused to call that solitary confinement or isolation because their argument was that he could shout out uh, from his cell through the bean hole, which is, um, which is the, so this is the inside of that facility. Um, the bean hole is what you see in these doors where they, um, there are openings where they slide meals to the prisoners. So the, so the prison administration's logic was that because Shaker and the other men who were are, who are held in solitary on the cell block could in theory shout through the bean hole and perhaps be heard by another prisoner who might respond in the same way, uh, that for that reason they had social contact and therefore it was, it was not sol solitary confinement, it was not isolation. Um, this is the inside of one of those solitary confinement spaces. Um, for our clients, you know, most of whom at Guantanamo, I mean, all of whom are um, Muslim males, most of whom are observant, practicing Muslims, uh, you'll see that uh, it, it's very hard to pray in that space. It's virtually impossible to pray in that space because you're supposed to maintain uh, your purity. You're supposed to be in a state of cleanliness when you pray. And the only way to pray puts your head next to the, um, uh, the toilet, uh, which, is, which is that hole that you see in the ground. Uh, this is Shakir Amr, the, the client that I mentioned before. Uh, he's a, this is a photo that was taken of him at Guantanamo by the Red Cross. Uh, he is a Saudi national, but you know, over, over time he had lived in the United States. Uh, he had resided for a very long time in the United Kingdom. Uh, his wife was a UK national. They had four children together. Um, they moved to the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region 
uh, for humanitarian reasons. He was a, he worked with uh, with a human with a with a charity that uh, focused on building schools for Afghan refugee uh, children and specifically schools for girls. Um, he was rounded up in after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, and and I think his case and many others exemplify the flawed selection mechanisms that were put in place by the United States, the, the troubling way in which any Muslim who was deemed to be out of place uh, by the US government, any non-Afghan or non-Pakistani Muslim who was in that region was automatically presumed to be a fighter. Uh, the reason that's troubling and the reason that's problematic is because in, a, in, in an unfortunately sort of typically narrow-minded American way, it ignores a very long history of volunteerism uh, in, in, in the Muslim tradition. So in much the same way as uh, you know, some of you or people that you know may have gone overseas, including to conflict zones, to work in the Peace Corps or to work for various humanitarian organizations, similar tr philanthropic traditions have existed uh, in, in uh, Muslim-majority lands for centuries. Uh, so people traveled to be teachers or traveled to start schools or traveled to be humanitarian aid workers or medical workers, including uh, traveling to conflict zones for those purposes. And yes, people also travel, traveled to be volunteer fighters. Uh, but the problem with the U.S. approach to what was going on in that region at the time after, they, after the United States invaded in 2001 was that all of these categories were conflated into the category of the foreign fighter. And even that, that nomenclature should be, uh, should be troubling uh, to all of us because because they were deemed, any, any Muslim, any, any, any person like Shakir, for example, a, a British resident, a Saudi Muslim, in that Afghanistan-Pakistan border region was automatically deemed to be a foreign fighter. Uh, but the US military, with its expanded footprint in that region at the time, they were not deemed to be impermissible, unlawful foreign fighters. Um, and so that, that definition itself tells you who holds the power in that dynamic. Um, and so Shakir was, like many other prisoners at Guantanamo, um, lumped into that category, uh, held in facilities in Afghanistan at first, and then brought over uh, to Guantanamo. But you don't have to really take my word for it. I mean, I think the numbers tell the tale. So at its height, the prison population at Guantanamo was, I believe, 779 prisoners. That's sort of the, the, the total number of people to have been held, the total number of people to have been held that we know of at Guantanamo, because there's also there's been reporting in recent years about a secret CIA facility at Guantanamo where many people were brought in and out. So setting aside that place, the military prison at Guantanamo has held 779 people. When you think about it, over 500 of these folks were released unilaterally by the Bush administration before Obama ever came into office in 2009. And that tells you something very specific. It tells you that the rhetoric that the Bush administration, that very high-ranking officials in the Bush, Bush administration, like Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, the rhetoric about the prisoners at Guantanamo being the worst of the worst, being men that are so dangerous that they have to be shackled and treated like animals when they're being flown over to Guantanamo, otherwise they'll literally chew through the cables and bring the plane down, right? That was the rhetoric that was being put out there. Well, what, that, what the numbers tell you is that that rhetoric can only be false, because if it were true, there's no way the Bush administration would have just unilaterally released over 500 of these men. Of course, the Obama administration then comes in, and, and they gradually, through, through, through their efforts, release over 200 of these prisoners, but they do not shut the prison down. Contrary to President uh, Obama, and even candidate Obama's promise, very clear promise to shut down Guantanamo. And now today, we're left with 41 prisoners at Guantanamo, including three of our clients, down from sort of, again, at its height, 779 prisoners. Um, this is a photo of, uh, of Shacker's uh, four children. And, and I wanted to, to share this photo with you just to emphasize that the suffering doesn't end with our imprisoned clients. It, it, it extends to their loved ones. It ripples out from Guantanamo, and it, and it reaches not just their loved ones, but their communities and their societies as a whole. Um, and, so, and so in Shacker's case, you know, his spouse had to contend with figuring out or trying to figure out why her husband disappeared, uh, bringing their children out of that region, out of a conflict zone, and back to the United Kingdom. Uh, you'll note that uh, the youngest of his children, the one on, on, um, on the left here, or sorry, on, on your right, um, never actually met his, his father, right, before his father was released because 
you know, Shacker's spouse was pregnant with, with this child at the time that Shacker was disappeared. Um, so Shacker, we, we were finally able to get him released and return to the United Kingdom a couple of years ago uh, after, after a great deal of advocacy both in court and outside of court and different sorts of pressure and, and various campaigns including um, you know, campaigns by artists and, and, and politicians uh, and a lot of, of litigation in federal court here. This is another one of our clinic's clients, Ahmed al-Darbi, who is still at Guantanamo today. Uh, he's, a, he's a Saudi national. You see him holding up a photo of his uh, daughter and his son. Um, he, he also never met his son uh, because his wife was, was pregnant with his son when he was um, abducted and brought to Guantanamo. Um, we hope, I mean, he's one, of, he's one of, a, of a handful, of a minority of Guantanamo prisoners who were ever charged with any crime. So he was charged in front of a military tribunal. We worked out a plea deal for him in 2014, and hopefully he'll be released um, consistent with the terms of that plea deal in February of 2018 and return to his family in Saudi Arabia. Um, this is a photo of uh, Ahmed's father, who I visited in, um, in a town called Jazan in Saudi Arabia near the Yemeni border in the southwestern part of Saudi Arabia. Um, he's looking here at one of his granddaughters. I'm sharing this photo with you just to illustrate what happens when people are imprisoned for um, these long stretches of time. Uh, Ahmed's father passed away uh, three years ago. And he's, he's, he's not the only one. We've, my clinic has represented three uh, prisoners who have lost parents while they were at Guantanamo. And that's just an indication of you know, what it means to be in a place like that. For them, the fact that the loss of time, the loss of loved ones, all of that is irreversible. Uh, for men, again, who for the most part have never received any kind of uh, fair process uh, at, at Guantanamo. And, and the, one of the more shocking things to me over time has been to sit across tables uh, with these prisoners at Guantanamo. And these are men who have survived horrendous forms of physical and psychological and sexual torture and abuse at Guantanamo in places like Bagram in Afghanistan, in CIA black sites like the Salt Pit, which the prisoners there refer to as the prison of darkness. The US government refers to it as the Salt Pit. So we've had clients come out of all of these horrendous places and describe to us horrible, horrible experiences that they've survived. But um, every single one of them, when you ask them, because sometimes you know, when you're preparing, for example, a, a filing, a court filing, you have to ask these sorts of questions, right? So when you ask them, what is the single worst thing about your experience in US custody. I always, initially, I always expected our clients to answer that question with a description of something physical, something very painful physically, because I'd known that, I knew that all of them had been through some horrible, horrible experiences in that regard. Uh, but what was shocking to me was that every single one of them said the single most difficult thing, the single hardest thing is, and, and the worst form of torture for them, is the fact of indefinite imprisonment without charge. The idea that they have no idea if or when they will ever get out of that place, if they're ever going to get to see their loved ones again, if they're going to get to hug their kids again, or see their wives, or see their parents. Every single one of them, regardless of what they've been through, uh, gave the same answer to that question. That indefinite imprisonment is the worst form of torture. And, and it's a form of torture, by the way, that affects them, but it also affects their spouses and their families, because they don't know either. I had a, I had a client of mine who you're going to see later um, who, uh, uh, who, whose wife um, had, had toiled uh, for years, right, after her husband was disappeared. And, and she, I, I'd never heard her cry. Like, I'd had all these conversations with her over the phone. She'd been extremely helpful in, uh, with, with her husband's case, giving us all kinds of information. Uh, she was always available. She was always very enterprising um, in her advocacy on behalf of her husband at Guantanamo. And the day I picked up the phone to call her to tell her that her husband was on a plane to Algeria, that's the day that she cried. That's the only, that was the first time that she allowed herself to cry. Uh, up until that point, she just felt that she had to hold it together for their kids and for her husband. And, uh, but, you know, that was the reaction. Um, so we're often asked, you know, how does one sort of come into the, these kinds of cases? To, to represent a prisoner at Guantanamo, you have to be a U.S. citizen, uh, you have to be an attorney, obviously, or, or a law student practicing under the supervision of an attorney. 
Uh, if you're an attorney, you have to be admitted to the bar of one of the uh, United States. Uh, and you have to have a security clearance at the secret or top secret level. And the way you obtain a security clearance is by submitting one of these forms to the U.S. government. It's an extremely invasive uh, form that literally gives U.S. government um, authorization to probe into every aspect of um, you know, your personal life, financials, academic records, even some, um, some categories of health records. I, I remember when I, um, when I applied for my security clearance in 2005, it, it, took, me, it took me a year because of my, my personal and family background to, to actually get my clearance. They, uh, you know, they would just show up at, at my workplace. They, they probably went to uh, my college to get some records there. And they showed up at my residence unannounced and started knocking on neighbors' doors and leaving cards and trying to talk to people. Um, I think they actually talked to one of my former colleagues who's in, who's in, who's in the room here. Um, but I, I came home one night and uh, my neighbors who were... Uh, who were Peruvian immigrants who were sharing the, the studio next door. There were four of them, and two of them would sleep there by day, two of them would sleep there by night. Uh, they came up to me and they were like, what the hell did you do to us? Like, why, why is there an FBI card like under our door? When we, I mean, these guys were terrified. They were like, because there was, there was literally a card from an FBI agent that said on the back, we want to talk to you about your neighbor. Uh, and, uh, and so I was like, you know, you really don't have to talk to them. Don't worry about it. Like, so that's the sort of thing that you have to go through the, um, to actually meet with the prisoners at Guantanamo and, and take on these cases. You have to sign this non-disclosure agreement uh, having to do with classified information. Among other nice things that are contained here, it says that you, know, you are liable uh, for a fine or prosecution or a term of uh, years in prison if you disclose any classified information in an unauthorized way. Um, and, then, and then just to you know, sort of give you a visual sense of what it's like to try to practice law in a place like Guantanamo. This is, uh, this is Camp Echo. This is the place now where, where attorney-client meetings, most attorney-client meetings are held at Guantanamo. Uh, it's near some of the other uh, prison facilities. Um, I wanted to show you these uh, photos just to highlight for you how the normal, some, some of the normal assumptions of lawyering falter in a place like Guantanamo. This is a, a reproduction that I found online of the inside of Camp Echo. So these are the shacks where, uh, at Camp Echo where the attorney-client meetings are held. Um, now, just to give you a sense of the obstacles to the formation of any kind of meaningful attorney-client relationship in a place like Guantanamo, these are the same, same shacks where our clients, many of them, were interrogated and abused and tortured. So the, th these facilities, which were used in 2002 to 2004, 2005, primarily for interrogation and abusive interrogation, were repurposed in 0405 for attorney-client meetings. Uh, and so unbeknownst to us at the time, when I walked into one of these rooms for the first time in 2007, I think it was, um, you know, 2006 or 2007, I had no idea what the background was. I had no idea what baggage uh, this particular location carried for my clients. Um, so, so when you walk into that kind of space that carries that association uh, for a client and you're trying to build a relationship of trust, it's virtually impossible because for him, this is the place where he was interrogated, this is the place where he was tortured. So at best, you're another interrogator. And to overcome uh, that presumption, to overcome that hurdle, uh, takes literally years. And, and all of the progress that you might achieve with a client could be reversed in a heartbeat if you ask the wrong question. If you ask a question, even years into an attorney-client relationship, that remotely sounds like something an interrogator might ask or something that an interrogator did ask, then again, rationally, they will revert back into that state of caution. Some would call it paranoia, but I think it is a form of rational caution given their lived experience there. And they will assume that you're actually not who you say you are, you're actually an interrogator. Um, you know, not to mention the fact that, you know, you walk in there and, and, and your clients are shackled to the ground. Um, so, I, you know, every single time that my students and I walk into one of these spaces, we make it a point to ask in front of our clients for our clients to be unshackled. Most of the time that request is denied. Some of the time it's granted by the military prison administration, but they make us sign waivers that say, if your client kills you, basically it's not our fault. Uh, so we sign those waivers and then they unshackle our clients. Um, but again, I mean, it, 
To me, this illustrates how the entire place is designed uh, for two purposes. One is dehumanization, so to, to, give, uh, to, to make sure that you are sending, that the prison sends the message to the prisoners in every possible way, at every possible moment, that they are less than human. And, and shackling them to the ground during meetings with their attorneys sends that message. And then the second purpose is intelligence collection. Everything is monitored, everything is, is, is recorded. And this is an illustration of that. I mean, I, it's, it, looks like, it looks like a smoke detector, right? Um, what was revealed, and this is public, what was revealed in a military commission proceeding at Guantanamo was that it's not actually a smoke detector. And the way this came to, to light was that some lawyers were sitting down with their client. Um, they were trying to have a conversation with him. And the client said, the prisoner said, I'm not really comfortable going into this because you know everything is you know, being recorded. And he pointed to the smoke detector. His lawyer said, no, that's a smoke detector. The prisoner said, no, I don't think it is. I think everything is being recorded and, and I think this might be a device. Um, the lawyer said no and like climbed up on the chair and like tried to unscrew this thing to demonstrate to his client that it was just a smoke detector. But when he actually managed to get it unstuck, they looked inside and it didn't at all look like a smoke detector. And so ultimately what the government acknowledged was that it was a recording device. And I had a similar experience with my clients where, you know, initially in 2006 when I started meeting with people, with prisoners at Guantanamo, you know, they would say to me, you realize everything is being monitored and recorded, right? And I'd say, no, uh, look, you know, there's a protective order issued by the federal court that says that, you know, these are attorney-client privileged meetings, conf they're confidential, they're sacrosanct, there's no way that they would violate that court order. Um, but with time, as with many other things that my clients said initially that I disbelieved, they've turned out to be right. I think in my opinion, at this point, if you ask me whether or not if, my, if you ask me what my working assumption is, my working assumption is that you know, most, most things are probably being listened to. Not that they're gonna be used in court against my clients because then I'd be able to say, hey, you violated this protective order, you violated the court's order by listening to my conversations with my clients or recording them. Uh, but the entire place is designed for dehumanization and intelligence collection. So it only makes sense that everything would be wired. And that's not unusual when you think about federal prisons in the United States. Uh, that's the assumption that most criminal defense lawyers bring to that work, that you know, we tell our clients here in the United States, be careful who you talk to in prison, be care you know, beware of your cellmate uh, because things may be recorded, uh, because he may be an informant. Uh, be careful what you say on the phone to your family because that's definitely being recorded. Um, so, uh, so this is a, you know, just to illustrate for you briefly what some of the handicaps are that come with this work. Um, for the longest time, the, the U.S. government's position was that the prisoners at Guantanamo had no right to their day in court, right? So that was litigated from 2004 all the way up until 2008, and finally in 2008, in a decision called Boumediene that was issued on June 12, 2008, the Supreme Court said, no, the prisoners at Guantanamo have a constitutional right to habeas corpus, and habeas corpus is the ability of anyone who's been thrown into jail summarily by the president to go to court and make the executive branch, make the US government produce some justification for why they are being in prison. So that happens in 2008, right? So it takes fully six years from the day most of these guys arrive at Guantanamo to 2008 when the Supreme Court says they get, they should have their day in court. So then we started litigating these cases on their merits. We started getting what was basically the government's evidence, the government's justification for the imprisonment of our clients. And oftentimes, we'd get records like this. We'd get documents like this. Now, this is not a criminal trial. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, it, it's, it's actually, they actually use a standard that's used in tort cases, in slip and fall cases, in a supermarket. It's a preponderance of the evidence standard. So all the government has to show is that their beliefs about your client are more likely than not to be true. Right? So if there's a 51% chance that they're right about your client, that's enough to justify their imprisonment, your client's imprisonment, potentially for the duration of his natural life. And a lot of times the evidence we get looks like this. Uh, on the classified side, we'll get it unredacted or mostly unredacted, but the version that we can actually show our client will be just like this, usually, heavily redacted. Why is that a problem? Because as a criminal defense lawyer, right, the first thing you do uh, when you take on a case if there is a police report that says that 
um, you know, Leslie saw me or saw Omar uh, at you know, the corner of 42nd and 7th, uh, running out of that deli with a gun in one hand and a paper bag full of cash in the other, right? The first thing I would do if I were Omar's attorney is I would ask him, you know, there's this police report that says Leslie saw you running out. Do you know Leslie? Is there a reason why she might lie about you? Do you think she was there? Right? And a lot, of time it's, a lot of times it's through this sort of collaboration with the client that you're going to be able to compose a defense. Uh, but obviously, when you have a document that looks like this, you can't do that with your client. When all you can show them is a mostly blacked out page that doesn't reveal the identifying information about who's saying what about your client, oftentimes it, it could be triple or quadruple hearsay, as in so-and-so heard from so-and-so that this third person said that your client was at a training camp in Afghanistan, and you can't divulge any of these people's names because the government has decided to classify them in a very self-serving way, right? Because that, that's, a, that's sometimes a, a, an obstacle that's almost impossible to, to overcome. Um, another obstacle is, uh, is, this is the protective order that I mentioned earlier, the, the, the federal court's order that governs how we as lawyers are supposed to handle these cases. Um, and one of the things it says is this, that basically anything that our client tells us at Guantanamo is presumptively classified. So when my students and I walk into that shack that you saw on Camp Echo, and we ask our client, how are you today? How's the weather? And our client says, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Cuba. That is classified. And until we submit that on paper to a team of US military censors, and until they stamp it and they say, OK, it's unclassified, we cannot share it with the outside world. We can't file it publicly in court. We can't pick up the phone and call their relatives and, and tell them you know, he says he's feeling great. We can't share that with any reporters. So it gives the government complete control over how much information gets out of Guantanamo. Again, for self-serving reasons. These are men who have been abused, who have been tortured. So the government has every incentive in controlling what gets out. Still, almost everything you know about Guantanamo has been brought out by lawyers over the years because the prisoners have never had access to uh, the United Nations, even though the UN, many, many different branches of the UN have requested over time to be able to meet with prisoners. That's never happened. Uh, they've never had access to non-governmental organizations like Human Rights Watch. They've never had access to reporters. The only people who, other than interrogators and government personnel and you know, allied foreign intelligence services personnel, other than those kinds of people, the only people who've met with these prisoners have been in person, have been their attorneys. So the information that has come out uh, has been brought out by the lawyers, but through this laborious process where everything, almost everything has to be submitted uh, for review by military censors. And a lot of things are deemed classified. Some, some of these things, some of these decisions, in my view, are uh, improper. That they're, they're driven by a desire to, uh, to avoid embarrassment, frankly, which is not uh, a proper basis for classification. So, so what we end up having to do often is find other ways to collect information, because getting it from the government is difficult, sometimes impossible because of classification. Getting it from our clients Sometimes the government can impede that process as well. So we end up having to resort to other ways of collecting information about our clients to, in order to prosecute their cases, in order to move their cases forward. Um, this is an example of that. We traveled with a team of students to, uh, to Yemen uh, to collect information about one particular client. Uh, he, was, he was a man that the US government believed was a Saudi national. And, uh, and they were saying that they wanted to release him, but that the Saudis wouldn't take him. And so when we spoke to the Saudi government, the Saudi government said, well, actually, he's not our citizen, so we're not going to take him. But the US government was convinced that he was a Saudi citizen. Uh, and so we ended up going to Yemen in order to collect information from the Yemeni government there and from his family, proving that he's actually a Yemeni citizen, that he was born there, that he studied there, that he's a national of that country. We got a letter from the Saudi government proving, or it was a very simple letter, where they said, he's not our guy. And then with those two things, we were able to go, on the one hand, to the Department of Defense, on the other hand, to the Washington Post, uh, to try to put some pressure and get him released. And thankfully, the combination of sort of the private advocacy with the government behind closed doors and the public advocacy through the Washington Post convinced the US government that he's actually a Yemeni, and he was released uh, to Yemen. Um, 
This is uh, one of my students with, uh, with me and, and a team of military lawyers with whom we worked on Mr. Al Darby's case, who you saw earlier holding up his photo. It's a military commission case. So he gets military lawyers um, in addition to, so the military lawyers he has no choice about. He has to work with military lawyers under the military commission rules, but he has the option of retaining civilian lawyers at no expense to the government. So that's us, my clinic, my students, and I working on a volunteer basis to represent him. Um, I want to try to end with literally an illustration of how it isn't entirely hopeless um, and that our clients find ways to survive. I mean, one of the hardest things, I think, for many of my students who have worked on, on these cases with me over the years is that, you know, they come into a case and before they get to meet a client, and sometimes they never get to meet the clients. Not, not all of the students get security clearance and travel to Guantanamo. So for a lot of them, they come onto a case, they read the files, they read these, this, these horrid, uh, you know, detailed descriptions of torture that we've had to gather in order to do our jobs as their lawyers. Um, and naturally, they think that, you know, these men have to be broken men. Um, and that's why I think in many ways, you know, for me and for my students and colleagues who have had a chance to actually meet with our clients, we're in a much, I think, more sustainable place because we've been able to sit across the table from them and see that they have, despite everything, uh, they have not been broken by the torture that they were subjected to. They have not been broken by the years, uh, the very long years of indefinite imprisonment, not knowing if they're ever going to see their loved ones. And they've found ways to survive. They've even found ways to thrive and to continue to laugh and to love and even to trust, as difficult as it is in that setting, to trust us and to trust others. Many of them have found ways to do that. Um, and so that, to me, is, is a testament to their resiliency, the resiliency of the human spirit. And, I, and, it's, and again, it's what makes the work sustainable because otherwise, all you're left with is what you see on paper, which, uh, which is you know, a very systematic, methodic uh, um, attack by an organized force, a state, a government, to break down and dehumanize a single human being. Um, so this is art that was produced by one of our clients, Ma'ad al Adwi, who's still at Guantanamo uh, today. Uh, he was on the second plane. Uh, that landed at Guantanamo on January 16th, I think, 2002. And you see the unclassified markings, because obviously even the art that's produced by our clients has to go through, uh, you know, military censorship review. Uh, because, because, you know, obviously they want to, or their justification is that it may contain hidden codes, right, to the outside world, to, to, to their terrorist organizations, quote, unquote. And so the military censors have to vet every single, not just what our clients tell us, as reflected by our notes, but also anything that they produce, any, any poem that they produce, any, any painting, any sculpture. Uh, so of late, we've been actually getting a lot of art out of Guantanamo. Um, next week, uh, and I think my, my former colleague and friend Debbie might be speaking at, at this opening, there's an opening at John Jay College, January, what was that? October 16th, and it features a lot of artwork by a lot of these men, paintings and sculptures and, and models. So Mu'az, this, this might have been one of his first pieces of art. Um, he's entirely self-taught. At this point, he's, he's become so good that he's very prolific. He's producing sculptures and paintings much more sophisticated and complex than this one. He's even produced this like gigantic model of a ship, which we've managed to get out of Guantanamo. It was x-rayed, it was examined, and then finally, after a very long period of time, approved and cleared by the military censors, and we were able to bring it out. He made it, he's entirely self-taught, made it out of cardboard, reclaimed pieces of a string with no access to scissors or any sharp implements, with no access to glue. He made his own glue. Uh, this exquisitely detailed and realistic model of, of a big like galleon ship, like a 19th century type British ship, um, which he recreated from memory having seen a photo in an art class. And, and this ship is on display at John Jay, and I, I encourage you all, maybe I'll, I'll share with you through uh, Leslie and Omar the, the flyer for the event. You should all go and check it out because there are some amazing pieces of art that have been produced by the prisoners there. Um, this is our client, um, Ahmed Zuhair, and I want to end in my last two minutes with just a couple of photos of clients. So Ahmed, Ahmed Zuhair was, um, was a client that my students and I started to represent in June of... 2006. Yeah, I think the first time we met him was June 2006. And what he said to us on that first meeting was, I only have one condition. I'm always going to come out for the meetings with you. 
I'm never going to refuse a meeting with you. I'm always going to collaborate. Any information that you need, I will give you to do your jobs. Um, but I only have one condition. I don't want you to ever try to talk me out of my hunger strike. At, at the time that we met him in June 2006, he had been on hunger strike for a year already, since June 2005. He was being, for, he was being strapped to a chair and force-fed uh, three times a day in a deliberately demeaning and brutal and painful fashion to try to break his hunger strike. That's not unusual, and in many prison settings, particularly political uh, prisons, uh, that dynamic of hunger striking and trying to break the hunger strike is common. Think of the IRA prisons. Think of many Israeli prisons where Palestinian political prisoners are being treated in the same way. So that was his one condition. Um, and what he said to us on that day was, I'm going to remain on hunger strike until one of two things happens. Either, either I die. And he was like, I don't want to die. I'm not suicidal. I'm fine with being tube fed. I just don't want to be tube fed in a way that hurts me. I want to be tube fed in a, in a humane way, but I don't want to accept food from my captors. This is the only way I can exercise my autonomy as a human being. It's the only way I can sort of express my dignity. And so I'm not going to accept their food. And I want them to force feed me in a more humane and deliberately le less, less painful way. Uh, but I'm not going to break my hunger strike. I'm not going to voluntarily eat food until I land in Saudi Arabia, I kiss the floor, and, uh, and I see my mother. And that's exactly what he did. Um, you know, we represented him for three years. In June of 2009, we were finally able to, um, you know, th mostly through uh, litigation in federal court, finally able to get him released. Um, he arrived in Saudi Arabia, he kissed the ground, he saw his mother, and he, he broke his hunger strike. Um, and this is a photo that he sent us from, from Mecca, where he now lives uh, with his family. Um, this is uh, Muammar Amr, who's, uh, it's a photo he sent us literally two weeks after he was released when he got home to Algeria and saw his four children. He's the man whose wife I was telling you about earlier who cried for the first time when I picked up the phone a few weeks before this photo was taken to let her know that her husband was going to finally come home. Um, you know, the details of how um, he was taken into custody I think are important and I'll, and I'll, I'll end there. He, was, uh, he worked for um, an NGO in, uh, in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region. He worked with Afghan refugees starting in the 90s. Um, and and it, was a, it was an NGO that was de dedicated to um, Afghan refugee populations who had been displaced, starting with the Soviet presence in, in Afghanistan and continuing into uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. He actually had um, uh, refugee status granted by the United Nations in Pakistan. So he lived there legally as a refugee under United Nations protection in Pakistan, in Peshawar, worked sometimes across the border in Afghanistan with this NGO in hospitals as an administrator um, because he couldn't go back to Algeria. Algeria. He had a fear of persecution in Algeria for political reasons. Anyone with a Pakistani stamp in their passport was thrown into prison and tortured in Algeria at the time, and so he couldn't go back there. Um, and, uh, and so after the U.S. invasion, one night in, 2000, in late 2001, people show up at his doorstep. They bang, they bang on the door loudly. It's like past midnight. He wakes up. He opens the door. It's a group of armed Pakistanis along with one white male American who, you know, I suspect might have been uh, part of, you know, the CIA or some other U.S. government agency. Um, and, and they were asking for his upstairs neighbor, the Sudanese man. And so, they, so he takes them upstairs. They arrest his neighbor, and then on the way down, the American turns to him and says, well, where are you from? And my client says, well, I'm from Algeria, and produces his UN-issued refugee card that identifies him as an Algerian citizen who is a refugee with status in Pakistan. Uh, and then there's a debate in English that ensues between you know, the American and his Pakistani counterpart in English. And both my, my client, who had worked with US oil companies in Algeria, and his wife, who, who had a master's degree in English, understood English. So they were both able to tell us about this conversation in identical terms. So the Pakistani and the Americans are going back, and the American are going back and forth about detaining the Algerian. The, the, the American agent wants the Pakistanis to take Mr. Amr into, into custody as well. The Pakistani was saying, well, we came for the other guy. We came for the Sudanese guy. We got the Sudanese guy. Uh, why are we going after this guy? Ultimately, the American just ordered him to comply, ordered the Pakistani to comply. Our client was taken into custody too. The Pakistani tried to reassure um, our client's wife that she would see her husband in a couple of days, and that was the end of it. He was then taken to Afghanistan uh, at Bagram where he was questioned and ultimately flew into Guantanamo. And the only way we were able to get him out was after that Supreme Court decision that I mentioned, Boumediene, um, we, we went to the court and said, look, 
the government now has to produce whatever evidence it has for why it's been holding this man who's a refugee. And the government tried to fight us on that. They filed motions to try to object to having to produce the evidence. Ultimately, the judge agreed with us and gave them a deadline of October 25th, 2008 to produce their evidence for why this man remained at Guantanamo. And you know, sure enough, two weeks before that deadline, I get a call from the Justice Department lawyer representing the government in the case, and he says to me, uh, you know, tomorrow your client's going to be on a plane to Algeria, uh, and you know, would you please dismiss your case after that? Um, and, and that tells you something again, right? That the government didn't have anything to, uh, you know, justify or substantiate this man's imprisonment. And rather than sort of be put to their proof in front of a judge who, you know, by no stretch of the imagination is um, friendly to men like my client. Um, they, they prefer to just let him go. Um, so that's, that's the overview I wanted to, to share with you, and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, continuing the conversation.